Welcome, dear students, to our first lecture um, on in our course, the Master Program in English Literature. Now, of course, I wanted to meet you in person and, and, and we have an actual class in campus, but they keep delaying the start and I thought maybe I should cut time instead of wasting it and, and, and record my first lecture um, on YouTube and make you watch it and take the notes and feel free to contact me regarding any points and then after that when we meet in actual we just start with the presentation your presentation and this way we won't waste time i don't know how much time you would be wasted later on how the things would be organized but still from the beginning things are not that organized so we'd like to make some kind of solution now for the time being and and, and make use of the time and start with the with the lectures um by by this video online Okay, um, <clears throat> I think most of you, we are four, uh, uh, so with me five, and, and, and I believe, uh, except Suleen, um, the rest of the students know me and I taught them or I'm in contact with them in way, way or another. Uh, I don't know if, if Suleen, she comes to my memory, maybe she's a student I taught in fourth year, maybe not, I'm not quite sure in the last four years. But anyway, when you meet, maybe she could refresh my memory about that. Anyway, I would like to greet her and greet, of course, Hala and Nada and Juan. Uh, also, she's a new student. I met her shortly before her entrance exam. And I wish, you now your grades show excellent performance of you. So that we were glad to have such a, a very good quality student. And we are looking forward uh, for more cooperation, more work during this year. Now, um, you have a timetable and you know what are the lectures you have uh, during the week. And it's, it seems not very intensive, but you will be required to do some presentation and that's a bit hard work. You need to read a lot, you need to write a lot, um, comprehend, present. So there will be some kind of work, intensive work uh, on your part during the first course, but then after that, once you're done with it, you'll go to writing thesis, and I think after that, this, things will be okay. Writing thesis will, can go smoothly once you just settle down with the topic and the outline, and then that things related just kind of research, just your search, find resources, write it, um, do the discussion, the analysis, um, meet your supervisor, make the changes, and things will go smoothly after that. Yeah. Um, you will be required to write a report by the end of the sort of this course about the topic one of the topic i can choose and that report is going to be graded out of 50 and then the final exam is also 50 and the two will make 100 um, grades um, but i would like also to give you a grade for your presentation and i don't know how i can make it um, i would like first discuss with dr abin and see how we can arrange this um, what I would like to um, explain early is that you need to know method of writing your research paper. This is basic because you are going to write uh, your presentation in a written form, presented like a paper, like an essay, something like that. And it should follow the, the, the academic school of, of documentation, how you document, how you, you know, refer to the author you quote from refer to the book you, you just took some quotation from. This is very important. And you should know it and know it correctly at the beginning because later on all your writing will be depending on this and later on your thesis will depend on this. And luckily you are going to have a course in method of writing a search paper. And in this course, they are going to tell you something about method, different schools of, of documentation and in literary studies, which is cool. Mostly we are using a, um, M A L style, M A L style of writing. And uh, there's also Chicago Manual of Writing, and there are other schools, but but most of the literary journals and essays and books follow this system. You need also to check and make sure how to document when you take from online, like YouTube, for example, an interview on YouTube or online. So you need also to make sure how to document from 
video on online of how to code, what to write, how to write this. So you need, oh, my advice to you is whenever you want to include another author's opinion or something you quote or anything, my advice is you always check uh, books or journals or PDF essays that has author's name, the title of the book or the journal, and the date of publication and the page numbers and the city of publication. Those are the main things you need to mention in your own references. So make sure the book or the essay or the article you quoted from has these five, uh, five elements, these five information pieces. Uh, you will see many essays that has only author name, many essays, very good, you like, you want to quote, but it doesn't have title of the book or doesn't show if this is part of the book or essay. So you will see many things, but I would recommend you to avoid these things because then you say, okay, what am I gonna write instead of the author? I don't know the author. Well, I don't know the title of the book. So avoid this. Um, try always to cite from books that are online, which all the information has all the information that you need to cite it from. And try also to avoid books that are very old, like books published in 70s or 60s or 50s. Some of those books will be available online. Um, now, they are very, very useful books published in the 50s or 60s. They would be having rich information, but they are kind of outdated. And that might be a problem with your thesis, maybe not with your reports nowadays and during the master, but with your thesis, when you write your thesis, that the, the examiner is going to look at your references at the end, and they will say, well, most of your references are old, and you have to follow the new criticism and discussion about your topic and be aware of it. So it would be a weak point in your own thesis. It's okay if you quote from them sometimes. You know, it's a very good book. It's a very famous book. It's, it's the best write about this. But you need also to include recent books that are published after, let's say, 2010, let's say. So those books that are most recent. And you can also order books if you find it's very much relevant. I'm not talking about the course nowadays. And, and, and I mean, this year, writing courses and writing reports, you could develop a tool and use the books available. But later on, when you write your thesis, master thesis, you have to include very good books that are recently published and, and well standard books related deeply to your topic. That will lift your own thesis up shows that the, the student has research and depend on the books available on this and has quoted and analyzed and incorporate opinions. And, and so it's getting a very good look to your own thesis. And it will help you also with the analysis when you incorporate and include other opinions and other ideas and, and, and discuss them and put them in contrast or in similarities. And this is how discussion goes on. So um, there are also possibilities that you can order books. Of course, it depends on your budget and you don't want to spend a lot of money on this, but you would need at least six to seven books for your thesis that are very good books that are in depth and that are well written and related to your topic. You keep them with you so that every time on them, you can return to them and quote and add and do these things. And you can also use the online library, whatever available online PDF and essays, books, and other things, you can use them, of course. Um, you can also check the library in the Hope University. You can check the libraries in Arabic University. You can go for a trip there and, and check and copy and bring it back. Um, you can also, this is very important. For example, when you are writing a thesis about an American power, poet, um, let's say in the modern era, and, um, you, and you check the universities in America, and check the books on Amazon and check the author name. Like, for example, William Smith, he's an author of a book about the poet you're writing about. And that author, you check, you put it on Google and check, you say, for example, professor of literature, and see where he works or biography uh, about that person. And he would tell you if this book is recent, it's not old, then he is alive still and he's working somewhere in one of the universities. So he, the, the Google is going to give you information about the place of that author, where he works, what's he doing. That's good. Then you go and try to find his email. And once you find his email, write a nice 
email to him, tell him that you're a master candidate, you're writing at least about this title, uh, you come across his books, then he would be grateful if he couldn't provide you with a PDF of this book because it's difficult for you to access the books or more expensive for you, or he could provide you with these essays he has written, you cannot find it in another thing. Now, most of those authors will be very friendly and very helpful, and they are going to send you many books and many articles. And in this way, you have direct contact with that author of that book, and you have the books and the essays, and it's going to be a very good and very useful way for you. So try also to check this access, this channel. Once you find an author um, about writing about the theme you are writing about, about the author you are writing about, just check in his biography where he is working, and once you find what he's working, send him an email, nice email, and ask him to help you with the books and things he has. And in this way, you can have very good uh, source of information for your own thesis. Okay, so that's um, that's the thesis. Now, choosing a thesis, choosing a topic, that's another um, headache you have to go through. You have to choose a topic which you like, um, a field which you, if you are employed in a place, in a department, and they said, well, we need teachers teaching poetry we don't have teachers so you have to maybe you think it's better if you if your master is in poetry or they said well we just want a literature so you see okay i like novel i'm gonna do my thesis in novel now my thesis is novel but i teach drama and in other university i teach poetry so you can see that once you are a literature graduate um, professor with a master degree in literature you can teach also different things not only the thing you wrote your thesis about, novel or poetry, where you can teach varieties of literary uh, studies. So it's not restricting you from teaching something you like. If you your thesis in poetry, you could still teach novel if you like, and if the department needs. Um, so uh, there are the many, many things I would like to speak about, but for the time being, let's just um, have enough of this discussion, general discussion. Um, <clears throat> yes, today I said it's going to be introduction uh, to drama, and I have asked uh, Celine to present something about the beginning of a drama. I have sent you a very excellent, nice, well-organized, uh, kind of lengthy essay about uh, medieval drama and Renaissance drama, and I, and I requested you to to uh, present using this and using other sources as well. So you can make this as a basic a base for you, but you can also say, okay, at least your report should show three sources. So you can use another source you found very useful and you take information from, and another book you find very useful and you take information from. And this way you have three sources and you can make your presentation uh, based on those three sources you find with the information available. And if you are talking about specific play, then we would like you to read part of this play. Show us what the conflict is, what the character is, how the language is, how, how, how is the, the playwright is speaking about the situation, what's the dialogue look like. And you read to us part of this dialogue and you are free to use PowerPoint, you're free to just, you know, write your the parts you would like, like the audience to see and read and give it as copies to us and let us read it for you. you. You can stop us, you can comment, you can ask questions. You will be the teacher and you are free to choose any way you find is suitable to deliver your own lecture presentation. Now your presentation will be graded not only according to the information you have, but also according to the way uh, you, you teach, your skills of teaching, because you are future, uh, you are a project for future teachers. You will be teaching teaching at a college level, you need to show the skills of teaching, how you, you know, engage all the students in your class, how you look at all of them, um, your voice, your intonation up and down, uh, the examples, make it lively, make it dynamic, make it like dull and sleeping, you just talk all the time. Um, stop it and ask questions, cut it and, and open a discussion. Well, you are free to do anything you want, just make it lively, make it useful, make it um, clear as, as, as much as possible. And of course, as I asked, you need also to present at the end your report written and following all the documentation necessary. And nicely written in an envelope with your name and everything, a folder starting with your name and everything, and present it to me so that I can grade it and, and we can, the students can have a copy of 
of, of your presentation as well. So that's, um, yeah, so we'll start first. And I just pick Celine, I mean, I'm not for anything, um, a reason, just, I just saw, okay, I'm gonna ask the students and I just come across such such an arrangement. And if she does not feel, but she, she, she wrote to me, she said she's okay with that. Uh, so that's fine, but if she would, does not feel okay to be the first, then okay, we can we can find another person, and you feel free if you like to change. But but when once I ask, for example, let's say I ask Joanne to present next lecture, for example, next lecture Joanne is going to talk about this. Now oh, sh she should be ready, and if she feels she is not ready for one reason or another, then it is better that she inform me early in the beginning that I know. Okay, that person is going to present, and we need to find somebody else to present, or I have to present it, or or I do something else. But it is not going to give a good image of you if you do not make the presentation. So make it best that you do it, and do it in advance, so that if something happened, for example, a situation in your family, health a problem, you have already prepared the presentation, it's already done, it's already good, you just need to go on, and that's it. So this is one of the things you need to... Um, and think about it. Um, I'm going to cut you when you will present and ask us some questions. And I now would like just to see how you answer and how in control you are of the topic. Um, if you like to keep some kind of small papers with main points written in, you feel free to do that. But I think you prefer you to have it written and just read from the paper you have written. It won't look nice. It won't look um, um, like a lecture. In all right, so that's um, that's it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you some introduction about uh, medieval drama at the beginning, just as an outline of the main things we will dive later on in details uh, about it. Okay, let me share the screen with you. Okay, good. Uh, you can see here, there is um, England, the map of England, right? And the, and the three conquests. Now, England had three conquests, three invasions, and we are going to discuss it. It's also important that you have some historical background uh, about England before you come to know about the dramatic schools and, and currents and movement in England at that time. We have, uh, this is the map of England, uh, of course, there's Scotland, there's Wales, there's England, and there's Ireland, of course. Now, there's the Roman conquest in 55 BC, uh, before Jesus, and the Roman general emperor Julius Caesar invaded Britain, and uh, the invasion lasted for 400 years. That's a very long time of occupation. Of course, at that time, England was um, inhabited by people called Celtic or Celtic. Um, maybe I should write it down. Celtic or Celtic, depending on how they pronounce it. I don't know if you can see it. Wait, you can see it. Yes, Celtic or Celtic, uh, which is a tribe lived in well, the inhabitants of of England at that time fishers, hunters, mostly people, and different places in the forest, in the mountains, they are living there, it's a simple life. Uh, so they have no knowledge of civilization, no, 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 um, no, any cultural life, just a very simple um, village life, style of life in small, small villages. Now, Roman Empire was developed, highly developed, advanced uh, civilization at that time, and has a great power and great army, so it invaded this island and occupied it for 400 And they also brought the Roman arts and the way of, of building cities and building 
houses, um, towns, roads, and markets. So they brought lots of lots of Roman um, artistic uh, and uh, architectural art with them to the country. Uh, we have after that uh, the Anglo-Saxon tribe, which is actually German tribe, or the Germanic tribes. And there are three tribes: Anglo, Saxon, and Jutes. They invaded England uh, as the Roman Empire getting weak and weak. They withdrew, leaving the chance for the German tribes to discover, go uh, for a trip, for adventure to see this in this new land, this island. And then after that, they have the Norman, which is the French conquest uh, in 978 till 1066. And as you see, this is why you can find some words uh, in English. Um, and it's rooted in the Roman language, in the Latin language. Some words rooted, rooted in French language, some words rooted in German language, because actually there are three different languages, three different civilizations that occupied the, the island for a long time. And of course, this language, um, the language mixed with the natives' language and how English later on developed out of three, three, these three languages. All right, what do you have here? Now, this is a picture of the medieval time, and you probably have seen it on TV. There are lots of movies about the Vikings and the, and the Roman Empire and the England at the beginning. So you are familiar with, with the way they are dressed, uh, with their wars, with their life, and all these details. Now, the beginning of the medieval drama in England, and that's what we are concerned about, how drama started in England, how it began. While the Greek drama has its rich heritage in dramatic performance and its sturdy development, English drama shows no such beginning and a strange way of development as was born, ironically, in the church. Yeah, drama was born in the church. The first performance was in the church. Now, since the fall of the Roman Empire in 467 AD, the Roman Catholic Church took a total domination over the lives of people in Europe. Of course, the church was a strong, a very strong, powerful institution in Europe. It decides, it determines, it even tells the king what to do. So it was a very huge, um, influential inst institution in Europe. The church encouraged arts in the form of religious painting and architecture, cathedral and church. Um, Buildings. Of course, you see that lots of paintings and beautiful architectural design, as you see in this picture, are all coming from the church. The church was a place of worship, but at the same time, a place of wonder when people, the villagers, the simple people, would just sit there and look at the painting and look at the picture. And um, it was a way of enjoying art. Here is another picture of the inside of the church. Look at the different paintings and the colors and every, the windows. It's a beautiful, marvelous piece of work. Here are the, the arches, the vaults, which represent beautiful, beautiful design. It's in France of architecture, a marvel in architecture. Yeah. This is a painting. If you check religious painting during the medieval age, just Google it, you see lots of religious pictures about Jesus, Mary, angels, crucifixion. So 90% of the paintings there were about religious paintings because actually artists um, were commissioned to do these things, paid by the church and the, the, to, pay, to, to make these paintings. Um, you can also think of the Sixteen um, Chapel in the Vatican, which is drawn by Michelangelo, beautiful ceiling, um, which represent 12 pieces of different parts of from, from the Bible, stories from the Bible, drawn on the ceiling. And it took him, I think, four years to finish it. It's a very famous place, Sistine Chapel in the Vatican uh, by Michelangelo. Oh, I have it here. This is Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. And you can see here the picture where he represents God as an old man touching Adam. Adam is born by this touch. 
And of course, in the corner, you can also see some pictures of where, where Adam disobeyed God and was expelled and, and other stories from Moses and from other, um, from, from the Old Testament. Yeah, this is also, the, I told you the picture where Adam disobeyed God and he was um, dismissed from, from the paradise by an angel. Uh, this is another picture where crucifixion of Jesus. Most of the painting, as I said, during this time is religious painting. This is another picture. Okay. So we have something called tropes. What are tropes? Perhaps the very, very first Christian theatrical performance came from what is called tropes, dialogues or songs. Tropes evolve over the years to include a number of participants, monks, nuns, um, choir boys who sing religious songs. These songs were part of the liturgy. Um, it's an official worship service in the church. The church is when you, you, you go to the church and you do some service, you, you do some ritual, some performance uh, out of worship, out of devotion, religious devotion. Some of this worship, not only prayer, but songs, like a group of people sing a song, like those girls, they sing a song. Of course, it's all religious songs. And uh, it's, it's represented as part of the performance, part of the religious practice. And it's also in, encouraged people to join the church. It's not just a boring place where they sit to the, listen to the sermon, but there is also songs and um, some dialogues there. Um, it's also, a, we need to know, it's a way of teaching public the Bible. You need to understand that the Bible was written in um, Latin, and only few people in the city know Latin. Um, mostly, it's, uh, the, only the learned people speak and understand Latin. Those are the monks and the priests. But the majority of people have no access to learn this. They don't know. They can't even write, read and write. So they can't read the Bible. It was the way to teach the Bible. This is why drama was born in the church, because the church men, religious men, wanted to teach people the Bible, the stories in the Bible, the crucifixion, Noah's flood, um, the um, expel, expel of Adam from, from, from heaven, and all other religious practices. Uh, the way to teach it is by acting it, and the monk, monks themselves, the priests themselves, acting this. And doing the actor's role. So it was a way of teaching the Bible to people who cannot read or write the Bible. Of course, translating the Bible into any language was taboo, forbidden, and the church would not allow that. It was later on, I think in James I, when the first time the church, uh, the, the Bible was translated. But also Martin Luther was a German theologist translated into German language in the 15th century. Uh, but it was a, a very risky project he took, and they have to hide him somewhere uh, to finish the translation. Yeah, this is a picture of liturgy. It is a, uh, is a service, is a performance of the of the priests and his assistants, like lighting incense, like candles, doing some worship uh, in the church, part of the Catholic performance. Gradually, pieces from the stories in the Bible and the Old Testament were prepared. Sorry, Old Testament should be in capital here. We have the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew, the Jews' book. And we have the New Testament, which is the Bible. Okay, some some stories from the Old Testament and from the New Testament were somehow developed to be some kind of stories that can be performed, presented in the church. And on certain occasion, like it's Easter or Christmas, there would be some short performance in the church. They were a way to educate the public, most of which were illiterate about Christianity. They cannot read and write. So these dramatic interpolations never became drama separate from the mass itself. Although their success and popularity led to experiments with other dramatic sequences centering on women in the mass and in the life of a Christ. The actors in these pieces, of course, didn't think of themselves as actors, but they were just monks and nuns belonged to the church. The churchgoers obviously enjoy the tropes and more were created despite the church official position on drama. They didn't think of themselves, the monks, like they are entertained. They thought of some, they are educating people about the, about 
the Bible. So it was not a place for enjoyment, but a place for learning and teaching. Yeah, this is um, a stage. Well, that's a picture when drama moves from the church into the outside now. And it becomes a kind of entertaining things and somehow goes out of the context of the Bible into stories funny, make people laugh. <clears throat> when dramatic scenes were added that took the action outside the liturgy, it was not, not long before drama were being staged outside the church. The angle of normal drama, Adam, dating from the 12th century, has accepted the stage direction, establishing a setting outside the church. The play is to be staged on the west side of the church with the platform extending from the steps. The characters of Adam, Eve, God, called Figura, and the devil and the assistants were are given costumes and extensive dialogue. Now they are presenting it outside the church, probably in the backyard, probably in the back of the church. And they are including characters. Uh, we have Adam and Eve and then show how they were living in heaven and how they disobeyed God and were kicked out of, um, out of heaven for their disobedience. But this movement, this shift from the drama, from the indoor of the church into the outside, paved the ground for a later development. Now, later on, you will see later on that there will be no, no need for just monks and nuns to act, but normal people like a carpenter, like a, a grocer, like some any other person would like to act, they can say, oh, I would like to have a small play in Easter, and now the story also will change, no more religious story, but they could have still just some comedy, some funny thing from folk tales, from folklore, from whatever they, they have heard from their grandfather, grandmother, and they can make a performance in certain occasion and holidays. And that is a transformation because this gives birth to a drama as a drama, separate from the church, separate theme, separate place, and separate goal. Now it's entertaining, not educating, a religious thing. Once outside the church, you see, it becomes outside the church, the drama flourished and soon became independent. Although its theme continued to be religious and its service were connected with the religious use. So it still, still continued to be religious, but it's more because they were adding some comic scenes in their performance, making people laugh. So that's also uh, a change. The first and the most common type was called mystery plays. Later on, we'll see your friend Sudin is going to tell us more about these kinds of plays. They were the basic, uh, the basic structure of what later on developed into a drama. The three things, mystery, miracle, and moralities. Mystery plays, miracle plays are distinguished as two different forms, although the terms are often used interchangeably. Among the earliest form developed plays in medieval Europe, Medieval mystery plays focus on the representation of the Bible stories in church, told by objects such as um, creation, Adam and Eve, and murder of Abel, and the last judgment. Often they were performed together in cycles, which could last for days. They were called cycles because they are often present one after the other, one story after the other, like a circle. Miracle plays, um, from the title you can say, it's, it's, it's basically on the miracle of Jesus, what he has done. He walks on the water, he heals the blind, he um, uh, resurrects the dead. So Institute of Miracles performed by saints developed late in the 12th century in both England and the continent of Europe. You know. Most of these plays they were derived from the Bible stories of the life of Christ and Virgin Mary. Because of the Bible, it's not clear about many, uh, about many details of Christ's life. Some plays invented in new materials and illuminated dark areas, thereby satisfying the intense curiosity in medieval Christianity. Christians had about events in the Bible. So some of them are not very clear because the stories themselves in the Bible are not very clear. Mystery plays. As a drama develops, the plays were produced by members of craft guilds guilds craft guilds okay now we have carpenters now we have for example shop assistants now we have for example blacksmiths so each 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 craft is job they can make some kind of union some kind of group club we say let's say this use a modern term club 
and those um, those let's say blacksmith club they would like to make a play and they would choose a topic and they would choose a story and they would act it and those carpenters they would like to make a play so the, those clubs or we call the guilds uh, each one related to certain group of people certain crafts the job they would do work and during their life they are married they have families they are carpenters they do chairs they do whatever blacksmith they do whatever they want but during certain religious occasions they are going to um, yeah train themselves and choose a story and choose a custom and dress a custom and present some kind of a play it was a very nice thing they would do like a hobby uh, and perform it for entertainment and for enjoyment not for religious purpose Okay, beginning in the medieval period, the word mystery was used to describe a skill or a trade known only by to a few who are apprenticed and mastered this special technique. It also referred to religious mysteries. So it could refer to those people who have certain job uh, and make a play, or it could refer to the mysteries in the in the Bible. Uh, okay. The plays were performed again and again during annual holidays, as I said, and feasts, and texts were carefully presented, sorry, preserved. Some of these plays, such as the fall of the Lucifer. Lucifer is the name of the devil. So when God, you know, cursed him and dismissed him out of, out of heaven, so they make a play how the devil is dismissed. Others are elaborate, long in length and complexity, and resemble modern plays like Nuwa from the Wakefield cycle. Examples, water drawers, guild sponsored, new flood, the butchers, you know, those, they are butchers, but they also make kind of a club and uh, they uh, make certain plays. The woman taken in adultery and the shipwright, the building of the Ark of Noah. <coughs> <coughs> now we know, come to new kind of a play, which shows more development in the kind of dramatic performance in England at that time. It's called morality plays. They were never part of any cycle, those we mentioned, but developed independently. And that's something we need to stop at. As moral tales in the late 14th and early 15th century uh, continent in England, they do not illustrate moments in the Bible, no, nor do they describe the life of Christ but they instead describe the lives of people, ordinary people facing uh, temptation of the world, just an ordinary person who is, um, who is facing a temptation, whether she should do this, but this is wrong, and oh, well, what about the judgment of God? What about, so it is inner conflict he has, of course they represent this inner conflict by making the person dressing white here, making the person dressing black here, so the good angel telling him not to do that, the bad angel is tempting him to do that. So this is morality. It's not about uh, religious religious as stories from the Bible, but more is about a human being and how they, these human beings always, every day, every minute, face this temptation to do things that are against what he has learned as wrong or they are sinful and he shouldn't do it. So this is a performance of the morality plays. You can see those black figure giving wings you can tell easily these are the devils and those white figures wearing the dress white obviously these are the angels and how we are always in this situation man is always in between good and bad and which side is going to win the good or the bad so here they represent allegorically allegorically means the abstract ideas of good and bad is seen as characters as people the audience can see this is the good angel driving into the good this is the bad angel or the devil trying to shift man to do bad things so it's also teaching but teaching morality yeah one feature of morality play is their reliance on allegory as i said a favorite medieval device allegory is a technique of giving abstract ideas like good and bad like uh, kindness like greed, like hatred, like kindness. These are all abstract ideas, but you can see this abstract as a person on the stage wearing certain clothes to indicate he's not a good person, black or, or mostly black, or, or they would 
put on or they have something tell them this is um, uh, an ally to the devil uh, and the good things of course wearing white and nice face and graceful look okay in morality plays abstraction such as goodness become characters in drama they use allegory permitted medieval drama to personify abstract values such as sloth laziness greed daintiness the vanity strength and hope all of those ideas we read about they you can see them as person as people on the stage um, so this is a way of teaching people uh, moralities and ethics the central problem in the morality place was the salvation of a human being represented by the individual struggle or conflict to avoid sin and damnation and achieve salvation in the uh, other world as in every man which is a very famous play from that um, era where we can see the good uh, side in him represented by an angel and the bad side that tempt him to do sin represented by the devil wearing the black clothes and this is the picture we can see here the angel and the devil and he is in between man struggling for uh, salvation okay so that's um that's very brief just i hope i have given you some you know image idea picture how drama started in england at that time what are the roots of it and how it develops later on uh, of course when we talk about uh, drama in england you could also remember, for example, drama in, in, in Roman Empire, and their drama started a lot, lot earlier, and it's more sophisticated. They have like a huge stadium where they present the tragedies of Sophocles, like King Oedipus, for example. Later on, we'll mention it, uh, or or uh, comedies of Euripides, for example. Um, so they have a, it's a huge art, artistic phenomena and it's very well sophisticated and developed they have the characters the plot the story everything and the, the conflict is so it's not about religion it's not to teach the bible it's all an entertainment industry where it's and it's artistic as well because there is a competition among the writers and each year they present their plays one of them win a prize as so in, in 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 drama and there is also competition in poetry in epics so Roman Empire has a great, uh, and the Greek as well, they have a great heritage in dramatic performance and it's well sophisticated, well advanced, and it's away from the Bible or influence from the church, it's a stand by itself. And later on, writers like Shakespeare, for example, or Marlowe, they would drive a lot from the uh, Greek and the Roman writers from uh, Euripides and Sophocles and King Lear, uh, sorry, Oedipus and, uh, and uh, so Antigone. And all the plays of the Greek and the Roman heritage, it would have a great influence on the writers until the modern time. We, we often refer to Oedipus complex in literature. So it has a huge impact on the development of the drama in Europe, but that's later on to come. But anyway, for the time being, this is the way the British uh, or the English drama started and developed. It's where it comes from, where it has its root. Um, yeah, um, there will be a lot to talk about it in details later on, but for the time being, I hope I have given a good idea about the uh, beginning uh, of drama in England, and I hope that you get some useful uh, ideas from that presentation. Um, so, uh, hopefully we'll see each other not next week, but the week after that, when the lectures kick off, and... Um, we will have lots of things to talk about and discuss. But for the time being, I hope you a nice day and take care.